Drive Coaching Studio, guiding business leaders to meet the highest version of themselves. And now, here's Michelle, certified coach and founder of Strive Coaching Studio. Hey, everybody. I am so excited to be here on podcast number 10, and I really love your support. I appreciate it. And mostly, I'm just really recognizing this number 10 as being something that's significant because there really is so much to talk about with regard to leadership, culture, creating a great workplace, and just becoming the best authentic versions of ourselves that we can be so that we can inspire other people to grow and develop and be better. And we all achieve our goals. And I know that sounds a little bit um, rainbows and butterflies maybe, um, but for me, uh, I kind of don't care. I'm really excited about the concept that the more we give and the more we help other people grow, the more everybody gets to grow. And in the end, we have better workplaces. We have stronger companies. We have higher quality people running organizations and businesses. We have happier customers. We have happier employees. We have so many great things. There is not a downside to it in any way for me. So this is a fun topic. Everybody loves to talk about delegation. What a fun one, right? Because it really ties into culture. And, you know, really most all the topics that I talk about end up tying into culture and end up really resulting in who you are as an authentic leader and who you want to be. And delegation falls right into there. We've all heard that old saying is a good manager is a good delegator. And sometimes it's a lot easier to say than it is to do. I think when it comes right down to it, most of us kind of squirm around in our seats a little bit about it. I think it causes a lot of discomfort and there's a, there's a lot of reasons why one of them is because it's just our habit. It's just the comfort level that we're in. We've might've grown something from the start and letting go of the things we've been doing all along and every day to build us to where we've gotten successfully doesn't feel like the right thing to do. If it's been working, why would we change that? So there's something just so natural about our habits and our, about our brain telling us, why would we change something? There's not a reason, a strong enough reason to change something that we don't need to look into how. We don't need to investigate too hard as to why. And so that's my goal today is to really show you that there's a lot of reasons why. There are a lot of benefits to it. And hopefully after I'm done sharing with you some of my findings on delegation, you may feel a little differently than you do right now. So that's one reason. We, we just have a habit of being in it, being in the weeds, not wanting to change, not wanting to grow, not wanting to cause more challenge or create disruption of a system that we've already worked really hard to fine tune and make it work right. So there's a lot of resistance there, right? So that's number one. The second one is we think in our minds that it's just going to be quicker to do it ourselves than to tell someone else how to do it. How many times have we either heard it or said that ourselves where our answer is, it's just, it's just easier and quicker. Just do it. It takes me just a few minutes. It's not even going to take that long than to teach someone else. I mean, by the time I tell someone how to do it, I could have had it done by then. I mean, we've all said it. We've all said it. The next one is purely perfectionism. We just think that we know how to do it. We're going to do it best. Nobody can do it the way we would do it. Nobody's going to get it quite right. It's just got to be done exactly the way we like it to be. And that prevents us from really ever turning anything over to anybody else because we kind of hold things close to the vest, right? And ultimately, when we stay in our limitation of not delegating, we ultimately set ourselves up for failure because there is going to be a time someday at some point in life where your internet didn't work to do the one thing, where your laptop was broken and you couldn't get in and log in the payroll, or you are on a trip and or you're sick, something terrible happens and you're unavailable. You're unavailable to even give instruction about how to do it. 
you don't have the technology to be able to do it. You don't have access to be able to do it. You can't get there. There is some limiting factor. And then what happens is you are in desperate need. It's an urgent problem now. And you make the phone calls, you, you send the emails, whatever you're able to do to try to help get someone else to help you with this or do it for you. You're now urgent. You're now desperate. It now feels like an emergency. You're spouting off all the things. You're frustrated. You're probably a little bit angry even. So you're not able to give good instruction to the person who probably desperately wants to be able to help you. And sure enough, it's highly likely that it will not go smoothly and it will not go perfect, especially under those conditions. So then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because by the time we've done that, we can now create more evidence in ourselves to just go, yeah, see, I knew that was a bad idea. Why would I turn something over when it could easily fail? If I just do it myself, I don't have to worry. But we all know that that can really backfire on us. And that kind of proves exactly why we should look at all the reasons that delegation could be great. I'm going to use that example. My husband and I ran a business and we had 50 employees. And we were at that time the only ones who would run payroll and put that final stamp on things. And we had an internet problem because we were traveling. It shouldn't have been an issue at all. But of course, unexpected things happen. Next thing you know, we're getting on the phone with our payroll provider trying to get them to help us because we didn't have anybody authorized in our company to be able to manage payroll and handle this for us. So we're on our trip and spending all day with our payroll company to make sure that payroll can get done. And we're literally minutes before the funds have to hit the bank or nobody's direct deposits are gonna hit. And imagine what a problem that's gonna be when 50 employees have bills going out and being paid and their direct deposits for their pay doesn't hit their bank account. Now, luckily it worked out. It did. We didn't have 50 angry employees that day, but you can see the stress that we caused ourselves unnecessarily. So it's easy to want to hang on to those things, especially when it comes to our money and our finances, but at least have backup plans, at least have a person, at least have a trusted individual. If we had, we probably would have saved ourselves a lot of stress. So Generally speaking, what is the cost of not doing it? And that's one of them. I just gave you a great example. But beyond that, because that was a, 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 an incident, right? But beyond that, the cost of not doing it ultimately means that we remain stagnant. We can't grow. And we can't enjoy freedom and be peaceful, knowing that things would be okay if anything went wrong, where a mistake happened, where we were unable to follow through on a task that we had. So the things we tell ourselves, it's so funny how we can kind of play both sides of the fence here. So many people say things like, we really want to grow our business. I need to learn to be a better delegator. I want to take on more responsibility. I really would like to get to the next level. I really want more freedom and peace. I really want to be competent to turn things over and grow. I want to... I want the ability to inspire and motivate and empower other people. And yet we continue to make the decision to hold things close to the vest for our own reasons that don't make any sense. And it ultimately results in exactly that remaining stagnant, not growing, not being free, not motivating, motivating others. So what do you have to gain? How much is it worth it for your time, your peace, your freedom, your flexibility? what is it worth to you? What do you want for yourself? What is the value of this? Well, here's a story that I'm going to share with you that I think will help resonate for you. I was a small business owner myself as well, as you know. And in the end, I ultimately started it from scratch, doing every single thing, doing every budget, knowing every number, having all contact with everyone. There's nothing that happened in that company that I didn't touch, that I didn't make the decision about that I wasn't involved in. But that wasn't the reason I started my company. The reason I started my company is because I was really good at a lot of things that my company offered. It's what made my company special. My creativity, my inspiration, my perspective on how I was going to do it, what product I was going to offer, what service I was going to offer that was different than everyone else's was the reason I started my company. And I wanted to attract other people who also followed because of those same reasons. 
So here's a litmus test for you. I wanted to do the things that I loved doing, the parts of my business that I truly enjoyed. I knew I was good at bringing, and I knew I was the only one who could bring it. And I knew that it was my stamp that made it special. Then there were all the other things on my list of to-dos that kept me from doing all those things that I love so much. I didn't get to be creative when I was doing payroll. I didn't get to inspire my salespeople and I didn't get to help grow my construction team. And I wasn't doing any training of anyone as long as I was doing a lot of administrative in the weeds work or special projects that kept me away from that, that somebody else could have absolutely taken from me. It limited the growth of me. It limited the growth of my company and it limited what I was able to bring my company every day, the parts of me that my company needed from me every day. Now, what does it do for your employees when you are able to figure out ways to delegate to them? It empowers them. They get to become more developed. They might be asking you for more responsibility. And what do you think will happen when you do trust them with a responsibility, when you do teach them how to do it? They become more loyal to you. That loyalty is what gives you exactly what your company needs, what you want, what they need, and what it takes for the company to have the best out of everybody. Now, what's the benefit to the company? Well, for the company, they're getting the best value for their money when you're able to delegate things off of you or encourage others to delegate things off of them. In other words, do the math. What do you make in a year and divide that out in a normal 40 hour week, 52 week year? What do you earn technically per hour according to the company? Is that the best use of those dollars? Would you pay someone that rate per hour to do the job that you need to have done or to work on that special project? My guess is probably not. And when you have a fairly nice size staff, 50 people is certainly a nice size staff for us. Why wouldn't I make sure that I'm paying market value for all of the responsibilities and the projects that need to be done within the company? My time and my value is going to be so much better used toward creating growth and creating more and producing more that the company can gain a profit from. So we talked about benefits to you as a person and as a leader. We've talked about the benefits to your employees. And we've talked about the benefits to the company. So what's in the way? Well, we say we don't have the time. We say that the teaching will take some time. And what I would suggest to you is the investment of that time is much better spent long term and will come back to you and pay you back very, very quickly. So I think the important part to do is in order to begin, the first thing you have to evaluate is knowing when to do it, when it makes sense, when it doesn't, when it's appropriate, and who has the best skills and the abilities to learn that task and those things. I'll give you an example. I had a administrative person who handled so many of the things for me early on in the busy days of our start of the company. And as we began to grow, she certainly couldn't keep handling all the same tasks. And every time I would try to take something off of her, she would almost like clench her fists to her chest, holding on to them because she just didn't want to let them go. And she would rather take on more and stay up all night than to give up something that was her baby. And I remember saying to her, listen, I need more from you. I want you to grow. You are more capable than this. You've done it. You've done great. And now you can be the teacher and teach someone else how to do it. And you can take on more. I need you for more. She knew that I was counting on her. And once she understood that I was counting on her to take on more and have a good, clean, fresh view and not be overloaded and not lose sleep at night in order to do it, 
that's what it took for her to let it go and be willing to take on more. I hope that story helps you. When you look at delegation in a little bit of a different perspective, I just recently read an article about apprenticeship and it really resonated with me and I directly associated it with this topic of delegation. And now I almost in my mind try to think of them interchangeably. When you need to delegate something, that isn't something that we just do in five minutes. An apprenticeship is having someone under you who sits in, who is a witness to it, who's learning as you go, takes their time. Maybe they take bits and pieces of it over time to start learning it more and more. They definitely will make mistakes. There definitely will be failures. And during that time, you have the opportunity all along to teach and correct and corral and adjust and congratulate, by the way, for the things they do well. It's not something that goes into effect immediately. It's something that's built over time. And not only can you do that for your own position, but what about all of the other positions in your company? If everybody understands that the only way they can rise and the only way they can develop and grow themselves is by having somebody right behind them who can handle what they're currently doing. That is such a huge benefit to them. They can see the value of why it's important, why it will be valuable. So one of the ways to consider that is committing to incorporating it as part of your culture of your whole organization overall. When it's included as part of your day, your month, your year, then everybody can start to get their head around the kinds of things that they can look at in their day, each day, and recognize what they might be able to teach someone else or what they might be able to ask someone else for, for help, or hand off something when they're gonna be on vacation. When it becomes part of your culture that you're able to do this and that it's encouraged, then you're building a company where you have more communication, more collaboration and support amongst each other, and the ability for people to develop and grow. And by the way, here's a, here's a side note of benefit that most people don't realize. When you have two people from two different departments working together and understanding each other's jobs and possibly learning some things that the other one is doing, many times the person from the other department shares ways that they can do that better. They share tips and tricks or they might say, hey, I don't know if you're aware, but this exists over here and it would probably help you do your job a little bit better. You have no idea the kinds of benefits that can come once you begin to encourage apprenticeship, collaboration, supporting of each other, and understanding what everyone's job is. So many times your own people will come up with better ways of doing things and more efficient ways of doing things than you would have ever come up with yourself. Why? Because you're not in the weeds and it's your not it's not your job to be in the weeds it's your job to create it's your job to be the visionary it's your job and responsibility to take that company to all the things it can do therefore trust and empower the people who are doing those jobs every day to see how it could be done better or the best way possible and look at ways of improving it constantly so what is your goal for yourself what is your goal for your team members? And what is your goal for your company? Do you want a growing, high-functioning company that maximizes its profitability? Do you want team members who are empowered and feel loyal to you? And do you want freedom, growth, and focus, and the ability to be creative and produce for your company? I think we all can grow so much with this opportunity. So in what ways do you think a culture that includes apprenticeship or delegation can be incorporated into yours? And what can you do to impact it immediately? I hope this shows you some really good value and really good benefits as to how you can look at this a little bit differently, how you can go forward tomorrow with beginning to implement some things that can make an impact. So, hey, listen, if you're looking for more guidance or direction on implementing delegation or any other leadership mastery into your organization, check us out at Strive Coaching Studio. We talk about all of these impactful opportunities that can create great organizations every single month. 
I have over 20 years experience leading and developing great people and organizations, and I've simplified it down into a strategic and pragmatic program where you can see results immediately. So check us out. I'd love to help and I hope we'll see you there. Check out our show notes in the podcast section on strivecoachingstudio.com to read these valuable tips. And thank you for listening.